appreciate all those who continue to teach boys and girls. Um, lots of opportunities for that, of course. Lots of people are working at that. Sunday School, Children's Church, Awana. Um, appreciate all of those are involved. Well, we continue with our series answering the question, what should motivate us to live for Jesus Christ? We have uh, looked at four different biblical motivations. I'm not saying this is exhaustive, but these are the four that uh, I've sort of categorized things into. So you can see them on the screen. And uh, we are now on the last one, living to receive eternal rewards. And the Bible has lots to say about this important subject. Um, last time, I kind of used an illustration. Uh, we we're talking about there's two doors, two keys. Scripture talks about justification, first of all. Uh, Sharon went to work and made this kind of picture of what I was talking about. Hopefully this will be helpful. We have here uh, one door that, of course, is eternal life, free entrance by using the key of faith. Faith alone, no works involved whatsoever. It is only faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. But then, once we're a believer, once we have faith in Christ, once we've experienced justification, the Bible promised us we have eternal life. Nothing can change that. Now, there is a second issue, eternal rewards. And here, the key to this door is serving Jesus Christ. Here, how I sacrificially serve him how I choose to spend my time, money, and energy every day affects this. And so we want to keep those two issues separate. If we put them together, we're going to confuse both of them. Uh, and so we are keeping those two separate. Hopefully that will help us. Now, some might think about the subject of eternal rewards. Mm, Lonnie, that just sounds kind of selfish for me. That I should be uh, working to get something that I should be serving Jesus Christ with a kind of motivation where I can actually earn something back for eternity. I can actually have some eternal reward. That just seems selfish. Maybe as you look back, let me back up at these four, you say, well, okay, maybe that's in the Bible, but just doesn't seem as pure somehow as the others. Well, if you struggle with that, then I want you to think with me today and see that, um, no, I think the Bible teaches us that living for eternal rewards is not only a proper motivation, that's why Jesus and Paul and many others told us about it and told us to live for that motivation, but it will bring glory to Jesus Christ. In the end, that's what it's all about. So, we want to see today that being motivated by eternal rewards is a proper motivation because God has commanded us to do so and is longing to reward us. God is longing to reward us. I hope you see that from uh, what we look at today. First of all, our eternal rewards will bring glory to Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at just three verses there. Uh, we went through Ephesians here a couple months ago, and when we talk about marriage and especially husbands and wives roles we go one of this is one of the key passages we go to Ephesians 5 but we're going to center our attention today on verses 25 26 and 27 Ephesians 5 25 follow along as I read husband loves your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Jesus Christ bought us with the price of his own life and his own blood. That's what verse 25 says. Husbands, love your wives. Good reminder. We're not going to center on that today. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him has, present tense, eternal life. 
Jesus Christ came for the purpose of dying to shed his blood for the payment of our penalty. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have that eternal life. We are justified. Hopefully we're getting a little bit familiar with this circle. Aspects of salvation the Bible talks about. Saved is a, is a general term, and even spiritually, uh, salvation is bigger than just justification. The word saved is used of all three of these. Justification, first of all, saved from the penalty of sin. That's what verse 25 is talking about. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you were justified. It is accomplished. It is final. It is finished. And the promises of God in his word apply to you. Now, verse 26 goes on and talks about Jesus preparing us for himself. That he, Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That Jesus might, this is something that is ha hopefully happening in our lives, in the lives of every believer, talking about the church. And uh, he does this individually in, in all of our lives. Why? One of the purposes of God is that Jesus Christ might sanctify and cleanse her, or us as believers, with the washing of water by the word. Now, I don't think that's talking about justification. I don't think that's even talking about, let's get over here, even talking about this positional sanctification. We know that that's already accomplished. At the moment that you and I put our faith in Christ, we became saints, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5, last few verses, verse 19 through 21, talk about imputation, big word, charge. Charge, you use a credit card all the time, charging things. God charged our sin to Jesus Christ on that cross so that he could pay the penalty for us. And then when you and I put the faith, our faith in him and what he did for us, God charges or imputes or transfers the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is perfect, to your account. So that you and I are positionally sanctified. We are perfect. That is done. There's no more processing going on there. But this is talking about a process, is it not? This is talking about something that hopefully will happen, that he, Jesus Christ, might sanctify, set apart, make holy, sanctify and cleanse her, the church, with the washing of water by the word. I think this is ta clearly talking about experiential sanctification. It is Jesus Christ's goal that you and I would be set apart from sin in the sense that we have victory over sin. We're no longer controlled by it. We're no longer captives of it. How does he do that? By the word of God. That is why we need to study it and memorize it and apply it and communicate it. We need to have the word of God help us to be set apart from sin. And of course, the Holy Spirit is power. His power is uh, enabling us to do that. That is the process that you and I are to be involved in, to be set apart from sin, being cleansed and washed by the word of God, it says. Now, I think that fits the context as well. He's not saying to husbands, husbands, love your, tell your wife you love her on your wedding day and it's accomplished. No, he's saying love her every single day. And it should have an effect on her life. It should benefit her. She ought to grow and mature and, and blossom and glow in that love. You know, we've studied this passage talking about nourishing and cherishing down in verse 29. This fits the context. Jesus is nourishing and cherishing us as believers so that we will experientially have victory. And then verse 27. Again, that. So that, here's a goal, so that he, Jesus Christ, might present her, the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. The goal is that Jesus Christ someday at the wedding ceremony will have a glorious church 
that has been purified, that has been experientially sanctified as we look back at this uh, circle. Glorification. Someday being saved from the presence of sin when we're with him forever. But what kind of a church does he want as a bride? He wants a church that is experientially sanctified. That is a glorious church that will bring glory to him. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That is what God is trying to do in your life and mine with the Holy Spirit's conviction and power and uh, his wanting to lead and control our life. He is trying to form us into a glorious church. Now, when we see a king or a prince get married, he may choose a young lady who maybe has royal blood of some kind and maybe not. Maybe she's just a commoner. But he doesn't let her come to the wedding in her common clothing and her common jewelry and her common headdress. No, the king or prince goes out of a long, goes, spends a lot of money and a lot of attention and hires people and sees to it that this young lady is glorious on that wedding day. And of course, you see weddings like this on TV, don't we? And you know, the longer the dress, the train, the greater the glory and all of that. Why does he do that? Because it says something about him. It says something about the prince or the king that he can give his wife this. He can make her glorious. He can make her stand out as a beautiful woman. Jesus Christ wants to do that with his church as well. Our positive evaluation resulting in eternal rewards will bring great glory to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Now, here's a picture of a Jewish betrothal. We compare it to engagement, but it's stronger than our engagement. Technically, they were married. It would take a divorce after this, even though they waited at least a year or so to live together and consummate that marriage. But here you see the young man offering the young lady, as part of that ceremony, a cup of wine. This was his marriage proposal. He drank of it and then gave it to her. If she took a sip of that cup, she was saying, yes, I will share my life with you. I will share in your life. If she refused the cup, she was saying no. This is what Jesus included in the Passover the night before he died and instituted communion. As he really brought in a marriage proposal to this Passover, which was very foreign to the disciples. But he said, I'm making a new covenant with you. Here, drink of this. And by drinking of this, they entered into that new covenant with him that he was going to shed his blood and pay the penalty for their sin. Now, also during this betrothal, the um, young man would hand the young lady, uh, present her after she agreed to marry him, a long white gown, just plain white. And she was to wear this coat, this long white coat, let's call it that. She had a gown or a dress beneath it. But she wore this long white coat uh, over her wedding dress on w the wedding day. Now, during her time of betrothal, and you got to remember that they didn't do what we did. They didn't set a wedding day and send out invitations and say, save this date. Nobody knew when the wedding day was going to be. It was a surprise. Why was it a surprise? Because the groom had a responsibility during that betrothal to build a house or a room onto a father's house, whichever was the case, that was adequate for them to live in. And of course, it was up to the father as to when that was finished and when he could go get his bride. That was wise. You can imagine a young man being anxious for his bride and to live together with her to say, oh, well, you know, there's no windows and yeah, it still rains through the roof and so, but we could live here. Dad says, oh, no, you don't. Uh-uh, this is not done. This is not ready. You just keep working until it's finished. <laughs> 
It was only the father who could say, okay, now it's finally finished, son. You can go get your bride. That's what Jesus told his disciples, didn't he? When they asked him, when are you coming back to take us, the rapture? And Jesus said, only the father knows. <laughs> Was Jesus saying he didn't know everything? No, he's saying it's up to the father. I'm going, John 6, to prepare a place for you, a mansion, a room in my father's house. And if I go, I will return and come and get you and take you to be where I am. There you may be always with me. Oh, he was following this Jewish thing. That's why the rapture is what we call, it can happen any time. We don't know. He didn't send us a wedding invitation. He didn't tell us to show up at this day. We are waiting for our bridegroom, who's preparing a place for us, for the father to say, okay, that's it. The church is full and the, the place is ready. It's time, go get your bride. And when the father says that, then the rapture is going to happen. And you and I are on hold. We're waiting. But while we're waiting, while the, group, the bride is waiting, she's working on this coat. She's doing all the most intricate stitching she can do on the inside of this white coat. She is, why is she doing that? To show her love and her dedication for this bridegroom. And on her wedding day, she's going to wear it, and it's all in the inside. Nobody can see it. Say, wow, what's the purpose of that? Well, at the right time in the ceremony, as she would stand with her back to the audience and her facing her bridegroom as he's facing the audience, the guests that came, she would open this coat and show him all the painstaking hours for almost a year that she has spent doing the most intricate stitching she could do. Mothers trained their daughters for this job as they grew up so that she could do the most intricate stitching so that he would evaluate it and he would be thrilled. He would be proud of her work. Now, if she took shortcuts and didn't really spend a lot of time and did other things and spent time on herself and, and this wasn't really that big a deal, then, of course, she'd be kind of ashamed of his disappointment. You and I, as the bride of Jesus Christ, are waiting for our bridegroom to come and get us. We are betrothed to him. And we are to be serving him and representing him and working for him. And by doing that, we are preparing for evaluation day, which happens at that wedding ceremony. The beautiful symbolism of the Jewish bride and groom Jesus uses in this way. So you and I are to be busy preparing experientially being sanctified, set apart, growing, maturing, becoming more and more like Christ, serving him, representing him, benefiting his kingdom, and so on. And here's a picture that my wife painted trying to illustrate this, this gown, this coat that this, this uh, bride wore. And I don't know if you can see it, but there are words in there that uh, have meaning for us, purity and, and fruits of the Spirit and, and so on. And here's Jesus the bridegroom, evaluating, seeing how each of us lived our life and whether that showed our love for him or whether we were selfish and whether we just lived for ourselves, and whether we just lived for temporal things. You see, rewards is not only about us. Yes, God graciously tells us that he is willing to, to reward us for what we allow the Holy Spirit to do through us. Isn't that grace? <laughs> that is really grace. But you and I do have a choice there. But it also glorifies Jesus, our bridegroom. He wants a glorious bride. He wants her to be glorious when, on that day. And he's working, Ephesians tells us, to purify and cleanse and, and help her to grow by the word of God and be set apart from sin so that she is glorious. He's nourishing. He's cherishing us. He's doing everything. He's supplying everything we need. The Holy Spirit, supernatural power, the word of God. All we need to do is follow it and serve him so that we will be that kind of glorious bride which 
he can be so proud. Really, the issue is, let us not deprive Jesus of taking glory in us on that day because he only has one bride. And he's looking forward to that. It's not about us. Oh, we have benefit from it. Does the young lady who marries the prince or king benefit from it? Yes. But it brings glory to him. It's about him. It's about Jesus Christ. And so for you and for me to follow God's pattern and obey him and live sacrificially for him and represent him properly, it's not just about us earning eternal rewards. It's about bringing glory to Jesus Christ. He wants us, his bride, to be glorious. And that's why Jesus commands us to live for him now, motivated for future rewards. You see, obeying Jesus' commands about living for eternal rewards will be very important to us in eternity. You might think, ah, well, that's not very important to me right now. I have other things pressing to do. I want to accomplish this and that and all of our desires. It will be very important to us someday. And we need to get our priorities straight. I hear some people say sometimes, from Christians, oh yeah, I have great intentions. I want to serve the Lord someday. I want to do things for him and so on. But boy, I hope he doesn't come right now. I'm not ready at all. I, I've got a lot of things to do. I had a professor called Dr. Howard Hendricks. And uh, he would say, you know, if you are not living every day like it could be your last day here on earth, you are systematically fooling yourself. We need to be serious. The bridegroom could be coming at any moment. Our lives are filled with many choices as to how to spend our time and energy and resources. Some live for money, some for possessions, some amassing as much as they can, some to build and leave a name behind for themselves. Some invest their time in education and entertainment, hoping to find long-lasting value and enjoyment. You know, we have all the entertainment and Screens and iPads and phones and TVs and movies and all kinds of things calling for our attention today. What are our priorities? How do we make the best use of the choices we have in life? Imagine with me that you are a stock trader, an investor. Maybe you see pictures of uh, them on the Wall Street floor. There's many uh, around in buildings, TD Ameritrade and other places as well, constantly in looking for where to invest money. You are researching the best stocks to invest in. Suddenly you feel a nudge on your shoulder and you look up to see Jesus Christ standing behind you. Right beside your desk. He smiles, reaches into his pocket, and hands you a sheet of paper with the 10 best companies in which to invest your money over the next 50 years. He's all-knowing. He knows the future. You can't believe it. What just happened? God has given you the winners. And, and you were trying to predict them. You were guessing. And now God gave you that information. You are astonished at the grace of God and are excited. What would you do with your money? You would take those 10 companies and you would go all in. I mean, you would sell what you sell the other stocks that aren't on the list. I mean, liquidate. You would put everything in those 10 stocks in those 10 companies. Anything less than going all in would be a waste of a lifetime. Well, guess what? That's what God has done. That's what he's done, not just for this world and stock markets and what you could have amass at the end of your life, but what you could earn for all of eternity. Jesus is telling us in his word to be serious 
in priority about his return. He's telling us how to prepare for it, how to earn eternal rewards, how to be that glorious bride. And if you and I don't go all in for that, we are fooling ourselves. And we miss the opportunity, not of a lifetime, but of eternity. Oh, it's going to matter someday. That's why there's some tears of sorrow in heaven about what could have been had we taken the note Jesus gave us, his word in this case, seriously. Jesus commanded us to live for eternal rewards. And of course, we can't look at an exhaustive list this morning. We'll look at some more in the future, but a few of them this morning. What kind of commands did Jesus specifically give us? Well, here's treasure in heaven, Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Uh, don't put all your weight in the stock market, please. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. This is our focus. I again, remind yourself, my life, your lifetime on this earth is a speck compared to an ongoing, never-ending eternity. I mean, our minds kind of want to explode thinking about that. So we need to invest in eternity, not here. And again, we've got a lot of voices, preachers, books, sermons, talking about health, wealth, and success here in this life. Ah, oh, don't put your focus on that. You don't want your reward here, Jesus says. You want it for eternity. Don't focus on that. Focus on what will get you reward for eternity. And he tells us what that is. The more we have stored up, the more we can give away in service to God. Why do we want treasure in heaven? Because we're not staying in heaven in the clouds. There's a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. We will live on that earth as we were meant to live in the Garden of Eden. And we will be bringing tribute to the king and, and earning money and all of that. The more treasure we send ahead right now, the more account you will have to draw from and learn and, and use to glorify the king then. If you don't lay anything up for eternity, you will come into eternity with nothing to use for him. Remember the parables we looked at a couple Sundays ago, the meanest and talents. If you and I don't, aren't good stewards and don't use what God has given us here, we lose even that in eternity. You won't even have that to use for him. Unlike the other rewards revealed in the Bible, treasure in heaven is guaranteed the moment you lay it up. He says, there it is where nothing's going to destroy it. That's another thing. You cannot lose it. Every time you do a good deed with a proper motive, a deposit is made in your account of the bank of heaven. No, don't have that. The more deposits that you and I can make, the more treasure you'll have with which to glorify God. Luke 12, 33 says, Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. This goes against your own sense, natural sense, uh, philosophy, against the world's uh, philosophy. Not to give your money away. Um, you don't save it and amass it that way. Jesus says, sell what you have and give alms. Give to those who need it. Provide yourselves money bags which don't grow old. That's going to receive treasure in heaven. Well, Jesus talked about hospitality. Luke 14, 12 through 14. And he also said to him who invited him, when you gave, give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. Stop right there. That's what comes naturally to us. I'm going to invite someone over who will invite me back. I'm going to invite someone over who's like me. I'm going to invite someone over who, you know, same, we have a lot of likenesses, we have the same strata and all of that. I'm going to invite them over because that's just natural. Jesus is saying, no, invite some people who need, who, who you can help who have needs so that they won't repay you. And when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. 
Why? And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Hmm. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, what's in this for me? There's nothing in this for me. Oh, but Jesus says, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. At the resurrection, in the end, on evaluation day, eternal rewards, you, God will pay you for that. You see, it's sacrificial service again, isn't it? Not only hospitality. There's many ways we can do that. But sacrificial serving goes against our grain. <clears throat> Excuse me. Take sacrifice to, to give it away. I could have used that money. I could have used it. I, I could have used it. I could have given it to the church. I could have uh, used it for God. <laughs> oh, you can use it doing what God tells you to do with it. And God will repay you. And God doesn't repay you one-to-one. -one. What did he tell Israel back at Mount Sinai? If you worship me, if you serve me, if you stay true to me, I will bless you a hundredfold. God is generous, and he wants us to be generous. And he will bless us a hundredfold. Why would I invest and focus on getting only one back from the one I'm giving? And God will evaluate and reward multiple times. What does that mean? How do we practically do this? Take someone out to eat. Pay for it. You'll be rewarded. Not in this life. We're not interested in getting our reward in this life. We're focused on getting in the next life. Invite people over your home. When's the last time you invited someone over your home who didn't invite you over to their home? Maybe you'll invite over just a few small, cliquish friends, group. Invite people to your home, hospitality. Show them love, give, help them. Talk with neighbors in your neighborhood. We need to kind of be focused on this, don't we? Or we just go about our own lives. We're just so independent. You know, we have garages that open and close. We can get in our sealed car and back out. We don't have to say hi to anybody. Oh, we need to see how to help and affect for Jesus people living around us, people at work, people at school, on down the list. Jesus says, invest in other people, not, not just monetarily. We can invest in them in encouragement. We can invest in them in time. People need our time, uh, especially when they're in struggling and grieving and need, need help and need our support. Um, they need spiritually, <clears throat> need our help. All kinds of ways we can invest in people. Jesus says if you invest in people so they can't pay you back, I'll pay you back. And I'll pay you back uh, royally. Jesus also talked about suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. Luke 6, 22 through 23. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you. I like that. We've got students going to school. We've got students going to university. We've got people going to work. People in the public place, they don't want to hear the name of Jesus. And they're trying all their best to block it out today. And so they exclude us. And that hurts. And many times we get quieter and quieter and quieter because we don't like the feeling of being excluded. Jesus said, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil. They assassinate your character. They run you down for the Son of Man's sake. And not if they run you down because you've done it wrong. For the Son of Man's sake, because you're willing to stand for Christ, because you're willing to stand for His ethics, because you're willing to stand for truth, because you're willing to represent Him, because you're willing to talk about Him and offer that. That he is the only way. That's not popular today. And Jesus says, you are blessed if you stand for me. Sharon, going to school every day under threat of his life, which finally they carried out and martyred him. He has a martyr's crown. He stood for Jesus Christ firmly. And you and I have opportunities to do that in smaller ways. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, really. You know, my wife used to go to school in Montana. Very few Christians in her school. 
Yeah, they would say mean things to her. <clears throat> the girl on the bus would say, Sharon, I hate you, you Christian. She'd come home to her parents. Her parents say, you don't feel sorry for you. You feel sorry for her. She doesn't know Jesus Christ. She doesn't know, doesn't know where she's going. She lives you know, in sin. You feel sorry for her. Jesus says you leap for joy when you are persecuted, when you're excluded, when they don't want to be around you. Leap for joy. Why? For indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. You will be rewarded by God my Father for standing for me no matter what your treatment is in this world. Leap for joy. When you can stand for Jesus Christ. Lots of other passages talk about that. Don't have time to look at them all this morning. Suffering for the name of Christ. <clears throat> Helping those who are ministering. Matthew 10, 41 through 42. Jesus said, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. You got that? There are people ministering. Now, they don't have to be in full-time ministry only. But there are people trying to minister, you know, teaching Sunday school and, and Awana and, you know, all kind, missionaries, all kinds of ministry. If you help them, you have a part of their reward. See, some of us think, oh, that's only for, th this eternal reward stuff is only for the Billy Grahams and, and you know, the missionaries out there in the field uh, who gave it all up and, and they're out there. It's only for them. No, if you help them, if you encourage them, if you communicate to them, they're lonely. They're lonely out there. I read an article not too long ago, passed it on to our missions committee. The things the missionaries struggle with. One of them is loneliness. All their friends here in the U.S. just tend to forget about them. Out of sight, out of mind. They're gone. They're lonely out there. They're in a different culture. It is not, it, it, yeah, they're there to serve Jesus Christ, but there's nothing there that that um, comes naturally to them, that, that they don't have to work at, focus at. They're lonely. They need our encouragement. They need our prayer. Sometimes people say, you know, what, what can we do about all these? What can we do about these persecuted people in Pakistan and Nigeria and Iraq and Syria and, and on down the list, Libya? Prayer is one of the most powerful things you can do. How persistent, how loyal are we to pray for these people? Jesus said, if you help these people who are ministering, not only over there, here too, you receive part of their reward. That's why when we need to raise finances to go teach someplace, we invite people to be part of our team. It's a team effort. We can't do it alone. And everybody who t is a part of that team in some way shares in the reward. Jesus went on, he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Hospitality. Someone comes to town, missionary needs a place to stay. You give them help, you give them hospitality, whatever. You share in what God is doing in their lives and through them. Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward this is an ironclad guarantee you don't get that from any company you invest in on wall street come on you just give a cup of cold water this doesn't have to be super hard you give a cup of cold water to someone for jesus he says i say to you jesus god speaking won't lie you shall by no means lose your reward. There's reward for all kinds of sacrificial things. You and I need to be thinking, okay, what can I do to serve someone else in the name of Jesus Christ? Because that is important to God. So important, he's promised that he will keep record of it and reward us for it. And that's an ironclad guarantee. Jesus is telling us how to invest our life and why it's important. Wow. All these things we can do. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to 
his works. This is not talking about justification. That's not by works in any way. That, the key to that door to get eternal life, to get, be given the gift of eternal life, it's by grace alone. It's just faith in what Jesus Christ did. We are talking about a different issue. We're talking about eternal rewards. We're talking about a different door with a different key. And Jesus is telling us that I am coming back and I'm coming back with rewards. I want to reward those who have served me faithfully and represented me faithfully, and I will do it. Jesus promises to reward each person according to their works. We saw that. The question, well, this is not an exhaustive list, okay? I said that up front. I'm going to say it again. There's other things. We'll see some others in the future too, but you can go through the Word of God and see all kinds of things. But the question that you and I need to ask ourselves every morning is, what can I do today to glorify God and benefit his kingdom? What opportunities will today give me? Dear God, help me not to miss them. Show, make them clear. Help me to strategize and think about who can I go out of my way to call and encourage and pray with them on the phone. Do you pray with people on the phone? God hears your prayer on the phone. I've prayed with people on the phone and they're, they're shocked. They say, what? You can pray on the phone? Yeah, you can pray on the phone. God, God taps that line, okay? He hears it. <clears throat> you can pray with them. You can go see them. You can spend time. You can encourage them. You, you, can, uh, you, you can help them. You, you can go out of your way to smile at the, I don't know, service counter person who's not doing it your way or what you wanted or whatever. You can be kind. You can s smile at them. We live in a culture where people get scolded if they're smiling too much. Just heard about that the other day again. No, we as Christians, we need to represent Jesus Christ and his love. All kinds of little things that we can do. Jesus Christ promised if we sacrifice, if we go out of our way to serve other people in his name for his purpose, he will reward us. He's giving us the investment of eternity. All right, I hope we see today that being motivated by eternal rewards is a proper motivation. Why? Because God has commanded us to do it. Jesus over and over and over again said, do this so I can reward you because I want to reward you. He's longing to reward us. It brings glory to him. Bruce Wilkinson wrote, the asset you are managing is your life. Not the stock account, not a certain portfolio of money. The asset you are managing is your life, the sum of your talents, strengths, personality, and interests. Your opportunity is to manage your life in such a way that you greatly increase your master's kingdom. It is about him. It is about his glory. It is about his kingdom, not our comfort. Your master has not yet returned, and every day you should answer this question. How will I steward what my master has placed in my care? How will I use the talents, the personality, the gifts, the opportunities, the time, the energy, the money that he has given me? The home, the opportunity at work, the opportunity in class at school. How will I use that for him today? If the Lord wants you to have these privileges of a lifetime well spent, then it is a false spirituality that says, oh, I don't want any special privileges. I don't want any special rewards. I don't, I, I've heard people say, I just, I just want to make it to heaven. That's it. I don't care about any of this stuff. That's a false spirituality. You will if you want for yourself what the Lord obviously desires for all of his children. If you want what God wants, Remember, we need to grow in Christ. If our goals become his goals, his goal is that you and I are glorious when we meet our bridegroom. And it's a false spirituality to say, God, I don't care about that. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm not willing to focus on that or sacrifice for that at all. Paul Benware, professor at Moody, said Jesus would never promote questionable motives, nor would he manipulate his followers through carnal means. Let's not accuse, uh, you know, living for eternal rewards as some sort of selfishness. Jesus would never, never, uh, you know, 
recommend that. Rewards are a legitimate motivation because the Scripture declares them to be a worthy and a noble motive. David Panton. For reward is merely the tangible expression of the approval of God. And we may no more deny him the pleasure of expressing that approval than we need abjure, reject solemnly, it for ourselves. He who despises a throne despises him who confers the throne. You can go to Scripture and see that one of the benefits, one of the eternal rewards is to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the kingdom. And many people say, I don't want to rule anything. I'm not interested in that. Well, then you're despising the king who wants you to serve him that way in the future. Living for eternal rewards is not selfish. It is obeying Jesus Christ's command and it is preparing to be the glorious bride that he longs for and wants. He longs to give you reward. He longs to be able to say in approval, well done, Good and faithful servant, you were a good steward. You served me sacrificially. But it's up to you and to me whether we're going to allow him to do that. And that ought to motivate us. Father, thank you for giving us clear instruction in Scripture. Yes, you have given us the investment of opportunity of a lifetime. Not just this life eternity we would be we would be foolish not to focus on it to pass it up to write it off to say well i don't like that motive i i it seems selfish to me help us to understand why jesus spent much time on this issue commanding us to live for eternal rewards so that he can reward us, so that we can be the glorious bride he longs for someday, so that we, he can be proud of us, he can approve of us, we can bring glory to him. Help us each day to ask that question, how can I serve my Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who died for me today, and help others and represent him and benefit his kingdom and then do it for you have promised to reward us and bring glory to yourself if we obey. In Jesus' name, amen.